thanks very much for coming in, Tim. Now, let's have a look at what you do best, and that's some really finding unusual living specimens. We're in Papua New Guinea. We're on the trail of the Bulmers fruit bat. Never seen before, an Ice Age animal. You've tracked a few down to a gully. You have to wait till nightfall, and here you here get is. one. A little beauty here with a magnificent set of teeth. If we can get a close-up of those teeth. Look at those teeth. Very primitive, but oh so now. The ancient world and the modern world linked in one through this magnificent Bulmer's fruit bat. Uh, Tim. It's an Ice Age animal. It's an it? Ice Age animal. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about uh, how you discovered the Bulmer's? Did yeah. somebody write and say, Tim, come and have a look, we might have something that you'd be interested in? Well, no. Actually, a bloke found some fossils in Papua New Guinea about 10 years ago, and we all assumed this was a long extinct animal. And um, then they turned up in a cave in 1975 near the Octeti mine. And um, after that, they were all eaten by the local people, or so we thought. <laughs> um, and I was working with some locals at that stage and was quite interested in the bat, and did a search over about eight years in various caves around the area, and finally one day we just struck it lucky and there it was in the deepest and most inaccessible cave in the and, area. And is this, uh, you know, a real adrenaline rush when you come across an animal that you thought was extinct? It's pretty amazing. Um, it, to get that, that animal we had to climb up a, a tree overhanging this great doling, this huge hole in the ground about a kilometre deep and do it at night with a net. <laughs> it was quite, a, quite an experience actually. And ha what's the uh, numbers of the bullmers left now? Do, uh, do you think there's uh, hope that they can be saved? Yeah, they're gradually creeping back. We think that they started from a population of about 10 or 20 animals in the late 1970s, and they were up to about 130 in 1991, about 170 in 93, so they're slowly coming back. But you know, when, we, when they were first found in that cave, the local people said they had to put their hands over their ears, because the noise of the bats coming out was just so loud. You know? And when you say it's a, it's a relic of the Ice Age, what, what, is that, what does that mean, really? I mean, uh, there'd be lots of relics of the Ice Age wandering around. Well, that's true, but this particular bat was really common in the Ice Age. It was probably the common New Guinea cave-dwelling bat. And something changed after the Ice Age. The world got warmer, conditions didn't suit it, and it seemed to get restricted just to a couple of little caves. Right. Now, it, sound, it sounds as though living now in Papua New Guinea would have had it adapted an awful lot to be able to cope with what you'd call tropical conditions. Well, it lives in an area that's incredibly cold. Oh, it's right. right up on a mountaintop, about <laughs> 2,500, 3,000 metres high, yeah. Uh, tree kangaroos, you've found a lot of tree kangaroos that people thought extinct as well, haven't you? I have, John, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can yeah. call me Roy if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry, Roy, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sorry about that. No, that's all right. Wrong person. No. <laughs> I haven't called you Barry for years. That's right. <laughs> now, wasn't there one, wasn't there one, uh, one uh, tree kangaroo that on one side of the hill, people sort of liked it and respected it. On the other side of the hill, they were chopping its head off. That's right, it was, yes, indeed. Because it had what? It used to do an odd thing. Well, it's, it's a strange animal. It's, it's about as big as a, a medium-sized dog. Yeah. And it's very, very tame. For some reason, it hasn't got any fear of people. Oh. In fact, it'll kind of argue the point a bit with you if it sees someone coming through the forest. And the way it does, it throws its arms up like that and whistles and then climbs down out of its tree and has a go at you, you see, and the yeah. local people thought that when it threw its arms up like that and whistled, they, that it was recognising them as, as like a relative, you know? Like, yeah. come here, my son, kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so it was like, an, uh, it, it, it was, uh, what, someone who died and come back as a, a tree kangaroo. Well, it was part of the family. More or less, that's right. So they wouldn't eat it. That lot wouldn't eat it. Yeah. But the people on the other side of the hill thought it was the best tucker about, you see. And so. if it was stupid enough to come up and do that, then... That's right. That's right. They wouldn't even bother doing that. They just kind of slipped a noose over its head and led it back to the campfire, you know? That's a bit sad. How many of those left? I don't know, but uh, a few thousand, not many. Right. Yeah, Are there yeah. still animals uh, being uh, falling off the twig, so to speak, in terms of extinction before they're discovered? Yeah, there is. In fact, we've I found an echidna, um, a, a museum specimen of an echidna that was in the Netherlands um, that seems to have gone extinct Hang on. before it was even described. It was native to the Netherlands. No, it wasn't. No. It was it was from Erie and Jaya, but mm -hmm. you know the Dutch used to own it. it used to be old Dutch New Guinea and someone collected this animal and never thought anything about it and put it in the bottom drawer of some museum collection over there. And um, there it laid until I came along and had a look and said, it looks a bit strange, it doesn't look quite like your normal echidna. Now, uh, just going then to the fossils that you're interested in and, the, and uh, you know, obviously unearthing a dinosaur or two in your time, is it more interesting to find something that's living uh, as opposed to something that uh, has obviously been preserved in rock, so to speak, which knocks for six conventional wisdom about, say, the history of the planet. 
which is more uh, exciting? Uh, look, I reckon finding the fossils. It's, it's funny, you know, I always wanted to find some living new animals because it's kind of like, I don't know, it's a prestige item for a scientist, I suppose. Yeah. But there's nothing like the thrill of cracking open a rock and seeing something in it that no one has ever seen before that totally throws out of kilter like the received wisdom of everyone, you know, in universities anywhere. And there's a couple of times in my life that's happened. It's been fantastic. You literally just hit open a rock and there's this thing and you think, that shouldn't be there, you know, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, you make assumptions from fossils you found uh, in future years. You, you say that uh, animals, uh, marsupials in Australia are getting smaller. Fossils of, you know, ones living 20, 30, 40,000, 50,000 years ago were much bigger. But how can you be sure of that? How do you know the fossil you find is not a rogue? For example, if say, if say Bert Newton and Shane Dye died side by side and in 50,000 years time they found the fossils, they think, well, there were two sorts of species of humans. Well, that's a, well, one with a bloody big head, a, the other with a little head. One that's that big, the other that's really broad. I, I mean, know, I know, mate. But look, Roy, you're absolutely right, and it does happen. I yes. mean, some years back, my predecessor at the museum found a great big jawbone this big that he thought was from a kangaroo. Yeah. And they made a great big plaster of Paris kangaroo three metres high that scared every cow cocky that kind of came through the doors and looked at this thing, you know, yeah. looked up this kangaroo. It turned out a couple of years later that it was from a wombat-like animal. Great big thing. So my predecessor had to go in on the Sunday night with the sledgehammer and knock his bloom and plaster of Paris animal down. And his credibility it, went out the window. It did, yes. <laughs> Never mentioned since. No. <laughs> so people do make mistakes like that. Right. But of course my stuff is absolutely... Yeah, yeah, spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick question in passing concerning you know, living living fossils, the Tasmanian tiger. I noticed this whipped up a storm recently that there were a couple of sightings. Do you reckon there are some left? I know Gippsland, I think, is the area where they have been. There's a bit of a school out there uh, thinking that they might have spotted the couple. Could that be possible? It's possible, but not very likely. Look, right. when I found that new tree kangaroo we're talking yeah. about, the front banner headline on the local Erie and Jaya newspaper was Tasmanian tiger found in the highlands of Erie and Jaya, you know. Right. So people are a bit desperate to find the Tasmanian tiger, but... Right, very unlikely it's gone. The evidence, I think the evidence is, yeah, that it's gone. Yeah. yeah. Now, you grew up uh, in Sandringham in Victoria, and you, even as a kid, you had a profound sense of doom about the future of the planet, uh, based on what you saw happening in the world around you. You know, this sense of doom must have accelerated somewhat over the intervening years. Well, it has. I mean, look, it started... My old dad used to take me to the Red Bluff Hotel, where he'd have a beer and sit me down with a raspberry lemonade on the counter. And the sea, there's beautiful cliffs just outside the hotel, which was being used as a local tip when I was a kid. I mean, the only decent cliffs on the whole of Port Phillip Bay, really. Yeah. Magnificent thing was the local refuse tip. Yeah. And, you know, the, it was, there was an awful time, actually, to be growing up. Just seeing people just didn't care, you know? Yeah. The local swamp where I collected frogs was turned, it was first turned into a rubbish dump, then into a factory site. Yeah. And the areas where there was tremendous birds and lizards, just wonderful wildlife was just basically paved over. So basically, so, the future of the planet, as you describe it here, that humans are the future eaters. And if uh, what happened in New, uh, sorry, New Zealand, i.e., uh, a lot of people move in, Polynesian people, they run out of food, they get... Uh, War for, warfare begins, uh, you get tribes developing because uh, resources are, are short. Same thing happened at Easter Island. The same thing's going to happen with the whole bloody planet. There'll be wars about water soon, is that right? There could be. Water's a pretty critical issue, yeah. you know. It's liquid gold and people... So we're back it. We've had it. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that. It's all over. <laughs> Look, except, except for one discovery, the pill, mate. The pill or contraception in general gives us the chance Fewer to people. actually... Yeah, right. right. So you argue that Australia can only support, what, between 6 and 10 million people. Malcolm Fraser reckons we can have 50 or 60 million here. Well, I know, yeah. <laughs> but Malcolm well, Fraser's... Well, he wouldn't he? Well, he's... <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm grew up on the most privileged little bit of Australia there is, you know, out yeah. on the Western District Plains. It rains every winter there, you know, yeah. you get a certain amount. The soil's fantastic. If all of Australia was like that, we probably could support 50 million people. But he's only got to go up to Horsham or Japarit, you know, or somewhere yeah. up north to see what the real Australia's like. Yeah. which is miserable soil, unreliable rainfall, right. people scratching to make a living off the country. It's hard. <clears throat> now, sorry, just a personal interest. Humans, what's going to happen to us? How are we going to develop? I mean, will the four-second 100-metre sprint be broken? <laughs> and how high is the basketball hoop going to have to be in, say, a thousand years' time? Will it have to be 40 metres, metres high to, you know, to make it competitive? Because at the moment, Shaka Neal has just got to drop it in. How big are we going to get? Well, look, I reckon the Institute of Sport's probably already working on that, you know. They've probably yeah. got big dormitories full of blooming basketball players together, you know, breeding up the, yeah. the kind of super race of basketball players. And, Is that know. possible? Could we do well, that? Yeah, well, you could, yeah. yeah you'd certainly. But, you know, <laughs> take a while. Take a while to get there, but yeah, you could do it.
with this sense of doom that we keep on coming back to is can I ask a cutting point, an edge that we should be looking at? Now, obviously on the nightly news on the ABC, when the weather is there, there's a lot of talk about the Southern Oscillation Index. Now, obviously this is a difference in barometric pressure and things between, I think, Tahiti and Rockhampton or something like that. Mm. Now, is, what I'm interested in is where could people go outside and have a look, say, tomorrow morning and think, bloody hell, this, this is changing at a rate that it shouldn't be, or is it possible to see it changing like this? I was interested in the book The Future Readers. You, you say that uh, when the Ice Age began to recede, the temperature rose over, say, three, of, three to five years, That's enough right. to force the Ice Age to recede, obviously, further and further and further. That strikes me as a, as a staggering statistic, because we could be in a similar period now. Except we're not receding from an ice age, we're, see, we're increasing the temperature quite substantially. Well, you see, we're breaking new ground now because the Earth hasn't been as hot as this for the last 300 or 400,000 years, or maybe even longer. Okay. So we're going through a new threshold. It's not like we can look back at the fossil record now and predict what's happening, like we could have for the last 100 years or 200 years. So we're into new territory, we don't know what's going to happen. But you saw the Southern Oscillation Index uh, last night, I mean, it's, it's, it's dropping. You know, yeah. dramatically. Yeah, they're very and, um, you know, those floods off the coast of Chile are uh, signs that things are really So changing. it could be better. It could be terrific. It could be better. A lot more sunshine. Uh, yeah. What, Sydney would have a, uh, a climate like Brisbane. Brisbane would have one like Port Moresby. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, you'd move out of Port Moresby. That's right. <laughs> Is that the idea? It could be. We just yeah. don't know. Don't know. Mm. Yeah. But there must, be to there must be spots, I was thinking of when we are talking about Erie and Gyre before, now there's a glacier in Erie and Gyre, it's hard to imagine a, a country on the equator has a glacier, mm. but uh, if it's heating up, that might be the first thing to go, so if obviously not many people would be up there having a look at it when it went, mm. but it could disappear, and then you'd know you're really in trouble, because this thing has, I assume, stayed there since the last ice age, and all of a sudden it's gone. It's been there for two million years, and get up there quickly if you want to see it, because it's going to be gone in the next 20. Right, finished. That's bad. Yeah, the Merin is already basically dead, yeah. and the other glacier is just just um, holding on, but it hasn't got long to go. So we should get up there with flamethrowers and bloody, bloody that's right. <laughs> accelerate. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and, that's what uh, we're look at. The, the other thing then is uh, is uh, in the future readers. I think the most telling one of the most telling things is is that people come uh, from Europe to invade Australia with a very European idea of what Australia is like. Ah, yes. oh, right, OK. Um, the fly's not done or anything, is it? No, 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 no. No, no. That's, no that's right. <laughs> the ecological disaster has hit, ladies and gentlemen. The ecological disaster has hit. The Erie and Gyre uh, Glacier is gone. We're having a few problems with our vision. I understand the sound is OK. If you're not seeing this image at all, don't worry about it. It's not the fault of your television set. Your Samsung, your Philips, it's all OK. You're part of the future, ladies and gentlemen. It's the ABC that isn't. <laughs> Having said that, stay with us, please. We've got a couple of trained plumbers. That's right, plumbers, working on the problem right now. And I understand it's returned. Thanks very much, right. plumbers. And Tim has got his trousers back on if you missed it. <laughs> No, they came with a very European view of what Australia is and they thought that they were leaving a, a, an area of the world that was an advance of where they were coming to. But in fact, the truth is it was the other way around. That's right. I mean, people in New Guinea were, were growing vegetables while our ancestors were still hunting woolly mammoths. I mean, yeah, this was an advanced part of the world. But when people came to Australia, they didn't know what the hell, where they were coming to. Yes, yes. I mean, the early Irish convicts thought they could walk off to China, you know? Yeah. And it was just a... And people had no idea how the place worked. I mean, they tried to grow wheat in Sydney, you know? Down near the rocks would be hopeless. Bloody stupid. Yeah, I think. <laughs> they should have grown lantana. They should have got a local. That's right. And on that cheerful note, it's time to wish Tim all the best for another big fine future. And I ask all Club Buggery viewers, whether here in the rail link or there at home, to fiddle about with the cat and the dog as a way of thanking Mr. Tim Flannery.